Good morning. My name is Patty. I'm with the APA Florida Chapter Office, and I want to thank you for joining us today. I have to take care of a couple of housekeeping items to review before we begin this session. The bios for your, our esteemed panelists are in the handout section today. I encourage you to check them out because um, they are they are quite the tops in their industry, and they have a lot of good things to say, so check them out. Second, please submit all your questions through the Q&A box in the control panel. We'll be monitoring questions during the presentation, and we have saved time at the end to answer them. This session today is worth 1.25 CM. You can find the CM log and the event number at the top of those speaker bios. So make sure you um, do download that to get that information. Finally, we could not host this event without the support from our sponsors who are listed on today's agenda and speaker bios. Make sure you take a look at the annual and capital and gallery level sponsors. We cannot do this event without them, so we thank them. I thank you for your attention and let's get started. Jamie, it's over to you. Thank you so much, Patty, and welcome and welcome everyone. I'm so pleased to be back with you all for your annual uh, policy forum. Uh, we always enjoy doing this in Tallahassee, but there's some real benefits of doing this over Zoom, not the least of which is we're able to bring in presenters, speakers of the caliber of Dr. Arthur Chris Nelson, uh, who is coming to us from uh, Arizona. Uh, and again, Patty encouraged everyone to look at the bios, but I wanna tell you that uh, Dr. Nelson is a professor at the University of Arizona College of Architecture Planning. And um, he, uh, well, it's even more than that. I think it's also uh, planning architecture and landscape planning. And uh, he's a prolific author. Uh, he has many books and, uh, and we're really pleased uh, to have him. And he's going to be uh, kicking us off with the first of our presentations. He's gonna be followed uh, by Joe Farrell, who is in Florida. Uh, he is involved with the realtors at the local, state, and at the national level. So after, after Dr. Nelson uh, goes through demographics with us, um, uh, Joe is going to be uh, going through the why, you know, the market, what, what is going on. Uh, and I'll be following up at the end <clears throat> with solutions, you know, just uh, we're going to, we know, you know we're going to understand what the problem is, maybe why we have the problem, and then I'll talk about what we can do here in Florida uh, for some uh, solutions to get to uh, affordable housing. So uh, with that, uh, we're going to start, and I'm going to turn it over, and we'll have plenty of time for questions. Uh, you'll be putting your questions in the, not the chat box, but the question box. And we'll be and we'll be doing those, and we'll keep this fairly informal. And um, but the, turn it over right now to Dr. Nelson uh, to uh, show us uh, show us what the issue is. Great, thank you so much, Jamie. I'm delighted to be part of this operation. Um, I was asked a few months ago by Whit Blanton if I would was willing to do this, and I said, "Well, do you have? Can you give me three or four hours?" He said, "No. How about 20 minutes?" So. I'll do you give about 20 minutes of my spiel, my my take on on the big housing gap, the big housing issues in uh, tailored to Florida, but really uh, we see this all across the country. Um, I actually go by Chris, if you don't mind calling me Chris, uh, audience and and panel members. My full name is Arthur Christian Nelson, so Chris is half my middle name. Um, I publish as Arthur C. Nelson because Arthur C. Clarke sounded nice when I was publishing back when Arthur C. Clarke, the science fiction writer, was publishing. So it's one of those things. So let's move on here. Let me talk about the, uh, can you? Can I get the screen to share here? I can't, I can't seem to advance. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna talk about, um, you know, basically I'm gonna glide through all kinds of major trends, the big demographic trends for Florida, the big housing cost burden trends, the big underproduction, housing underproduction trends, uh, the big community preference trends, and then the overall, overall big housing gap. Uh, so I'll, I'll lay the picture out in terms of what we're missing in housing for Florida. Um, actually, I, I, I used to know Florida pretty well. When I was at Georgia Tech as a professor there, I would 
do all kinds of travels throughout Florida looking at plans for the state and local governments. But that's been about, I think, five million people ago. So I'm sort of out of touch now with Florida. Anyway, uh, then the others will talk about, uh, Joe and, and Jamie will talk about how we fix the gap or close the gap. This is uh, very sticky to get to advance. I don't know how to do this. Okay, uh, some of the big demographic trends, this is from the Schimberg Center. Uh, I use other projection sources that basically have the same uh, uh, numbers. So here we see the year 2020, we have about 21.4 million people in Florida. Uh, by 2040, we'll have about 24 million, you know, give or take. We'll add about 3 million people in Florida over the next 20 years. Uh, so a little less than almost a million people a decade. Um, but let's look at the distribution of that change. Although it's not a really big surprise, a lot of the change will come in people who are going to be over 65. Now, a large number of those people are already living in Florida. They're, they're, they're in their 40s now, 50s now, so they'll be moving from, from their age group now to become uh, over 65 uh, over the next 20 years. So, But then, of course, we'll have people moving in from other parts of the country into Florida as they have for, for a long time. Um, so here we see the, the, the largest share of the population change in Florida is uh, those over 65. At the, at the younger age, uh, we see the younger population under 20 uh, being increased by about 11%, but really accounting for about a fifth, 19% of the overall change. These are young people who are going to be entering the market after 2040. Uh, these next two age groups, uh, the 20s into the 30s, these are going to be people moving into the housing market uh, between now and 2040. And so the big question for them would be, will there be housing available for them? Because after all, when you're over 65, we know from all kinds of housing studies and data that these are people who have their own homes. Usually they own their own homes by a very large percentage, maybe even 80% in Florida. I don't, don't know the precise number. But it's, it's, the, it's this age group that will be squeezed as they try to move into the housing market when all the housing that's already, is already occupied by, by uh, older households. Now, this anomalous group here, these are the older uh, Gen Zs, uh, the, the baby boom uh, bust or the baby bust, as it were. Uh, so this, pop, this population group will actually be not very uh, large uh, change in terms of the overall picture between now and 2040. Now, I want to I, I want to mention something. My good friend Jim Nicholas, retired planning professor at University of Florida, some of you might know him, he always made the point, not always, but oftentimes made the point in speeches in Florida that in the year 1900, go back, you know, but the century before last, in the year 1900, Florida was the smallest and poorest state in the South. By 2000, it was the largest and richest state in the South. Um, that's that's a that's a remarkable change over over one century. Basically, a blink of the eye in geologic terms. So I'll advance hopefully to the next slide. Here we go. This particular slide is from the. Um, uh, National Low Income Housing Coalition based in Washington, D.C. They've done a, a, an analysis of each of the states. This is the Florida uh, slide. I just want to touch on a couple things. This is for this is their 2021 profile for Florida. 79% of all extremely low income households. Now, that those are households earning less than 30% of the median household income for the region. 79% of them uh, cannot afford, or they have, they're very highly a uh, cost burden for their housing. That's a large number, not surprising really, but that's still a large number. And then moving towards the center here, we see that affordable and available homes per 100 renter households. If we look at the extremely low, low income group at the bottom here, 72% of uh, extremely, extremely low, low income households cannot find a place affordable or available for them to rent. What do they do? They double up or they're homeless or you can just imagine what their alternatives are. And even uh, between that group and, and up to 50% of area median income, 62% can't find housing 
that's affordable to them. So uh, this is these are very large numbers for Florida, but they're actually quite typical across the country. Here we go. I want to walk through this particular slide. This is assembled for, again from the Schimberg Center out of University of Florida. They do something I haven't seen uh, across the country, which is really nice to know. They try to project the number of households by income group uh, and actually, actually by household size, which I didn't go into here. So I'm doing a sum of all the households by uh, area medium income, uh, 30%, 30 to 50, 50 to 80, and so on and so forth. And we're looking at their, their numbers for 2020, which are, these are the, basically the current numbers. So in 2020, looking at only the 30 to 50 to 80% of area medium income, 1.2 million households in Florida uh, are cost burdened. Now we have about 8 million households total. So 1.2 of the 7.8 million households are cost burdened, only considering households under 80% of the AMI. That's a big number. I was actually surprised to see that. Um, when I used to work in Florida in the 2000s and 1990s, um, this, this particular relationship was not as high as it was. So the house burden in Florida is getting uh, worse. Uh, fast forward to, the, to 2040 using the Schimber projections, they're anticipating almost 300,000 new households added to this uh, added to this uh, cost burden group uh, between now and 2040. Almost 1.5 million cost burden households by 2040. Of course, Jamie will tell us how we're going to fix that. I just want to lay out how what the numbers are are, are uh, projected by the Schimberg Center. So I'm going to talk about um, the big housing underproduction trends. So let's, you know, what is underproduction? I looked it up. Uh, here's how you pronounce it, underproduction. It's a noun. Production that is less than normal or than is required by the demand. Um, now, this is a very nuanced kind of definition because what is normal? Has there ever been a normal housing production year? anywhere in the US in its entire history? I don't think so. Um, we, we actually define normal as 10-year averages or 20-year averages or just some ballpark uh, figure about what sh normal should be. And sometimes we're above normal, sometimes we're below normal. Um, a part of that also is uh, looking at the demand equation. So this is a very interesting definition. So what I'm gonna show you is a working definition of underproduction applied to housing. And we'll do that, apply it to Florida. Here we go. So this formula um, and the, the, the overall numbers are from Up for Growth, a, a group based in Washington, D.C. that I'm a part of. They're going to have a, uh, an official release in the summer of this year, 2022, for all the states and actually a lot of the metros, uh, metropolitan areas in, in all the states, looking at the housing underproduction uh, between about uh, early 2000s and, and 2019. 2019 is the, is, the, is the most recent year for which data are available. Of course, the housing market has been crazy since then, although not as crazy as some people think. That's a, that's a separate lecture. So let's talk about these uh, the, the formula. So households plus vacancy factor generates the need. Well, what are the households? Households are, you know, most of us living in our individual unit, apartment, condo, townhouse, uh, single family home, whatnot, plus missing households. Well, what's a missing household? Um, back in the 1990s and 1980s, even 2000s, um, there weren't many so-called missing households, but now, with millennials staying in their primary homes uh, to a much older age than they used to, those would be missing households. Um, as those millennials now in their families' homes or doubling up, tripling up in their apartments or condos, uh, these are so-called missing households that are beginning to move out of their combined units into their own units. And this is what's causing some of the uh, housing, uh, increased housing demand, because well, of course we have free money, very low interest money for mortgages, pent up demand, 
uh, willing suppliers and so on and so forth. Anyway, so we have households that are innumerable plus those who are, should be in households by now but aren't. We add a vacancy factor of about 5% and then we come up with a total housing need minus total existing units, less second homes and vacation homes, because these are not for permanent residents, less uninhabitable units, those that are uh, no, no, no kitchen or no bathroom falling apart and whatnot. So we do, we do make adjustments. So we come up with the, the net difference being housing under production. And we've, we estimate that need in Florida to be about 250,000 to 300,000 existing underproduced housing units in Florida. And these will be on top of the 1.2 million units where households are cost burdened. So we see the squeeze in Florida between these, uh, these two slides. So let me go on to the next slide and we'll talk about another issue. So I gave you the, the, the picture as to the, the current and projected housing cost burdens. I gave you a sense of a snapshot of housing under production. The units were simply missing today in today's market, about 300,000 units in Florida. Now, now I want to talk about what people want to live, where they want to live, the kind of communities they want to live in. Now, if you're not familiar with it, I would encourage everybody to go to the National Association of Realtors Community of Preference Surveys. They've had these since, uh, the first one was 2004, but they've done these every three years since 2011, so 2011, 14, 17, and 20. Um, the next one is due 2023. They, they do a very nice job of capturing what it is in terms of the kind of housing and community people prefer to live in. Um, what I like about the survey is they, they start off with a very, very basic question. Right now, today, what kind of a house would you like to live in? A single family detached home, apartment, condo, all these options. Roughly 70% today, uh, year in and year out, want to be in their own detached single-family home. And we all get that. Uh, most of us probably live in that too. But then they say, are you willing to trade off that single-family detached home on a large lot or any kind of a lot for a walkable community or, or accessibility to transit? And when they sort, start trading these choices off, we get a much richer picture of what it is people would like to move into if they had the opportunity. The problem in today's market and, and all, all across the country in most markets is that we're overproduced in certain kinds of homes, but underproduced in other kinds of homes. And so we have this, in addition to the overall underproduction target, our distribution of housing doesn't exactly match what people's preferences are. So um, one part of the survey, and I'll show two slides about the survey, one part of the survey shows uh, the kind of uh, transportation related or walkability related preferences people have. So we can see here uh, for 2020, the NAR did a very smart thing. Uh, their normal surveys are early in the year. So January, February of 2011, 2014, 2017, and 2020. Well, then guess what happened in 2020, March and April, uh, COVID hit, uh, shutting all, everything down. So NAR did the wise thing, the smart thing. They went back and uh, redid their survey for July, 2020. Now, it'd be nice to have them do some, say something in 2021, but this gives us a really nifty snapshot of changes and attitudes uh, in the same year before and after COVID hit. Uh, what's remarkable to me is the, the, let's take a look at the the middle part here, the age group part, in terms of preferences for uh, communities with sidewalks and places that take walks. In February of 2020, um, by age group, the younger, let's take a look at the, uh, uh, the age group between 50 and 64, in February 2020, 51% wanted to be in a walkable community. 53% wanted that walkability in, in, uh, when COVID was in full swing in July 2020. Look at the younger age group uh, below that, 35 to 49, 
49% wanted walkability before COVID, 55% wanted walkability after COVID, same number for same distribution for seniors. What I'm getting at here is that um, although you have the sense that people wanted to escape population centers, escape density to escape COVID, and many did, of course, many more people wanted to maybe get out of the car and be able to walk around. If they couldn't socialize as a matter of, of, uh, of exercise or, or getting out, they wanted the walkability to walk the sidewalks or walk to parks and so forth. This is a very key finding that we're going to see lots of research come out, coming out on over the next couple of years, uh, perhaps some, uh, some by me. To get to, this, to the next slide here, there we go. Uh, I, I do have one more slide after this, I think. Then the NAR asked a very interesting question. Um, so the question would be among households is, um, would you trade off living in a home with a small yard that's easy to walk to places, or would you trade off houses with, with your large yards and you'd have to drive to places where you'd need to go. So which of these choices, you're living in a single family detached home, but which kind of community would you wanna live in? A, a small lot home in a walkable community, a large lot home in a drivable community? Well, what's interesting is that it's roughly half and half. These are national numbers, these are national numbers. Roughly half and half split between those who wanted the walkable small lot or the drivable large lot community. Um, and not a whole lot of change between the February and July survey figures. So not a lot of movement here. So population still might want to be in their detached homes, but half still want to be in a walkable community. The other half want to be in a drivable community. Now, in other work I've done, I won't show here. Well, actually, I think I'll touch on it in the, in the last slide. We'll find that we're actually overproduced in these homes and underproduced in these homes. So that's another, that's a growing uh, preference gap in terms of market analysis. And get to the next slide here. Now we look at um, trading off attached homes, apartment or townhouse, with detached homes. Now detached can be large or small lot, but still detached. So would you rather, if you're going to make a move now today, uh, would you want to own or rent an apartment or townhouse and have an easy walk to places and a, or a shorter commute or own or rent a detached homes with a, where you have to drive to places and have longer commutes? Uh, again, roughly 50-50 between those who want to live in an a, a attached home of any kind versus detached, detached, uh, drivable, attached, walkable, 50-50. And again, not much change between February uh, and July before and after COVID hit. Then we come to a very uh, nuanced question that uh, the NAR, NAR came up with, looking at matched and mismatched housing preferences. So I looked at the mis mismatch part. So if you're living in a detached home, in February 2020, um, and you prefer to live in an apartment or townhome, what percent of the people living in detached homes are mismatched? Turns out to be 22% of the people in detached homes would prefer to live in something attached. If you're living in an attached home, 10% want to live in a detached home. So you, you run the numbers, since more people live in detached homes than attached homes, you can see, just run the numbers, 80 million people living in detached homes times 22%. So roughly 17 million people now are mismatched because they're living in detached homes and want to live in, an, in attached homes. For the attached population, uh, 40 million attached uh, residents, 10% uh, of them want to, want to live in a detached home. That's 4 million. You do the difference. We have a uh, a 13 million uh, mismatch in terms of supply between the those who want to live in, in attached and don't and those who want to live detached and, and don't. Fast forward to the, the COVID period and the numbers don't change all that much. Some, but not that much. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the 2023 survey, which we hope will be after COVID has run its course. 
And then my last slide here, uh, this is a, a national overall picture uh, showing the housing supply in 2017, the housing demand in 2038, and the absorption difference uh, between a small lot, detached, attached homes, and large lot, detached homes. And so here's the supply in 2017. Here's the demand in 2038. These numbers are from Harvard University uh, that I've, I've adjusted and so forth. Here's the source of what of how I did this number, these numbers. We find that in by 2038 nationally, we will be oversupplied in large lot homes by about 22 million or so um, versus, versus our need to increase attached homes by about 25 million. Uh, detached small lot homes by about 22 million. So this is the increase, this is the new demand, this is the excess supply. Now adjusting these figures for Florida, and I, I need to do more work on this for Florida, uh, but that takes a lot more work than I thought it would take, unfortunately. But what I'm looking at for Florida is that between uh, now roughly and 2038, we'll need to add 3 million new attached and small lot homes to 2038 but we will have about 1 million excess homes on large lots than the market needs by 2038. Uh, now, one solution, of course, is to find those large lot homes that might be easy to subdivide or, or subdivide the lots or, or subdivide the homes, as we're seeing now in some states and maybe even some parts of Florida. But that's, that's part of Jamie's and, and Joe's uh, presentation. So, uh, that finishes my presentation. Thank you very much. I'll be happy. Looking forward to Q and A afterwards, and and on to and and on to Joe and Jamie, who will solve the problem for us. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Nelson Chris. That that was wonderful, and it raises a lot of questions. Um, but I'll go ahead uh, and let's hear from Joe, and then we'll go back uh, with our uh, to the questions. All right, well, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. My name is Joe Farrell. Uh, I work for several local realtor associations in the Tampa Bay area, uh, but I also liaison to our state and national association. And uh, what I want to talk about today is, you know, really what are realtors looking at today? What are they seeing out there in the market? And then how do they feel like that's moving forward? And maybe some solutions to that. But uh, I'll start off by saying this. In the state of Florida, we have 225,000 realtors. To give you kind of con context of that, there are about 200,000 realtors in the state of California. So we're, we're the largest data says so we have more realtors than anywhere else in the country. Um, and I look at that as there are a lot of data points. Uh, they're reaching out and touching people out in the community and kind of feeling what people want locally and throughout the area now. Um, I'll start off with my first slide. It, you know, is more data driven than what anecdotally what we get from our members. But as you can see, I, I I thought I'd look at it real simply, what it's kind of coming out of the pandemic, what, how things have changed. You can see with the, the bolded numbers that those are the percent changes, positive or negative. But what I wanted to highlight was those really big ones uh, kind of towards the bottom. We all know the prices are going up, uh, whether it's medium price, average price. Those two lines at the bottom for both single family and multifamily are what give us concern moving forward. As you can see, our supply is, is going down drastically. The absorption rate of homes in our community, uh, communities across the state of Florida, is at rates that we haven't seen two to three times a hot market as far as absorption rates go. And uh, if you're not familiar with the last line with the month's supply of inventory, that's simply a metric that we use that if no new homes are added to the market, that's about how many months it would take for the existing homes to sell. And we typically say, uh, our economists say, is that we want anywhere from around five to six months supply of inventory. Uh, obviously, we're slightly below that. Uh, as you can see, we were doing kind of okay in multifamily uh, across the state of Florida, but that's completely gone away. And then, you know, single family homes, that's been a problem we've been dealing with for several years. And it's a problem we've been dealing with uh, before the before the pandemic. You have... Coming out of the Great Recession, you had about five years of almost no construction, virtually no con single family home construction in the state of Florida. So the majority of people that did that for a living moved on to other careers, retired, whatever. Um, we see that throughout the pandemic as different people moving on after, just after two years. Imagine five years of, a, of an industry being strained that way. So we've been since, basically since 2013, underproducing 
uh, housing in the state of Florida. And that's, uh, we're, it's been an issue. We've seen the supply dwindling, getting lower, the metrics getting lower over the years, but then the pandemic just basically lit it all on fire in one way. Um, let me go to the next slide, please. So when we look at that, we we see that the prices are going in a lot of different questions, different directions. And I, I use this picture for my slides. I knew it'd make Jamie very happy, but uh, <laughs> seeing Senator Brandis there. But uh, you know, we go to Tallahassee, we talk about different things, and we look at the general prices of, of homes going up. But we're also seeing in our market something, depending on where you are. If you're in Miami, the Palm Beaches, Broward, Pinellas County, Tampa, uh, especially, you're seeing flood insurance rates go up incredibly. If you're in the central Florida and parts of South Florida, you're seeing uh, your general property insurance is going up because of roof in issues. Uh, throughout South Florida and in the Gulf Coast areas, you're having water quality, environmental funding issues. You're having private property rights issues, different cities. As a lot of our cities age, they're now becoming historic in nature. And that is something that there's a, a give and a take on that, that we have to take into account. And then we have what happened in Surfside in South Florida and what condo reform that's gonna come there. What we see is all these things are is increased pressures on the price of a home. So when you have the prices of homes going up 20 and 30% over the last couple of years, and prior to that going up 10, nine and 10% per year for the five years and six years prior to that, is that we've had this increase in demand, as we all know, we've had the supply that's constrained as Chris was telling us. And then on top of that, now we have just other frictions as we call them in the market that are going to come into and continue whether we have the supply and demand issues these are things that are going to be on top of it that uh our local governments quite frankly are going to have to address in a lot of these ways i mean obviously not the insurance costs but water quality environmental funding property rights condo reform these are ordinances and rules that are going to be coming not just from the state level but also the local level that are going to have to be uh or just considered when it comes to home ownership affordability and rental affordability in our communities. Uh, quite simply, I'll take uh, City of St. Petersburg as a uh, an example. When it comes to environmental funding, we have a coastal high hazard area as other places of the state do as well, but the coastal high hazard in the area in the state, in the city expanded from about, I think it was about 17% of the city to over 48% of the city. Well, the, the problem with that is is that you then have constraints on what kind of multifamily housing you can build. And a lot of those areas that are in that area are the places where people are looking and needing to rent, that walkability study that Chris was talking about. So how do we marry those two things or how do we how do we negotiate those two issues as we go on forward planning in our communities is something that we're very concerned about. I can go to the next slide, please. So looking at it, since I work in the Tampa Bay area uh, most of the time, I, I also do some stuff in other parts of the state, but I wanted to kind of just drill down real quick if you're in our area and give you the idea of what we're seeing. And I bet you other metro, the major metropolitan areas in our state are seeing the same thing. You see the number of sales just last year of single family homes and multifamily homes. It adds up to about 75, almost 76,000 uh, properties. You see the prices going up 21%, 18%. Um, what we like to look at, though, is say is to ourselves when it comes to affordability is are these prices outpacing what people can afford? And according to the you know recent Census Bureau and everything, the median household income in our area is just under $58,000. So I wanted to show people what that means if you have that and you wanted to get an FHA loan on a local home based off of really what their interest rates are going for today. And keep in mind, this does not take into account property taxes property insurance, which in some places in, in, in Tampa Bay area are gonna be approaching mortgage cost, uh, mortgage payment pro values. And you head up just on, before you get to those things, you, you already are gobbling up 38% of the household income just to buy a house. Now, you can make an argument whether that is in that kind of range of affordability, I, you know, and who can afford that amount. Um, but like I said, when you start adding on the the property taxes and the and the insurance it goes well above 38 percent and that's a concern for us because fha mortgages are the basically the the bulwark of affordability access to financing and access to affordability for single family home ownership it's it is available for multifamily home ownership for condos but it's very difficult and based off what's happened in surfside i assume it's going to get only harder for people to use fha and use financing to buy condos in the future 
there's a there's a lot coming down the coming down the the, ro the rails on that from Tallahassee real soon. So we're very con very concerned on those issues. But what we we see this though is that it's it's, it's you know very important and they were on, on the in the previous slide and I, I kind of missed this though but I wanted to get to is we're also seeing a different kind of buyer throughout our communities. In the past, you know, most people buying single family homes were people that had cash that were retirees that wanted to live in the home or they were families, you know, single family homes or second family homes moving forward, but they were going to be owner occupants of the homes. What we're seeing an incredible increase in our communities is across the state of Florida is cash buyers that are from institutional buyers, hedge funds uh, and other and, and things of the like. What we're seeing is basically a lot of what I heard, and I, I, I use this term all the time now, is the flattening of rental users. In other words, rental, most people, that used to be vertical and, and closer to downtown urban areas, if you will. Rents, rentals happen everywhere, but we're seeing entire single family home neighborhoods now and the majority of single family homes uh, and, and the expansion of single family homes being used for rentals. I, I use this as an example, um, Pasco County in Tampa Bay, has less than 50% of their single family homes are homesteaded. You know, when you think about that, there's gonna be vacationers, there's gonna be people that are second homes, but Pasco is not exactly a beachfront community. It's uh, basically a bedroom community for the Tampa Bay area. These are people that are commuting into work like myself. And so you would assume that a lot of these people, it's their home, it's their primary residence, and that there would be a lot of uh, a lot of uh, homestead in there, but it's not. And that's because so many of the homes now are being turned into rental properties. And we, we see this kind of pressure forcing out people that are looking into affordable home ownership. Uh, so I, I thought about this and I was like, you know what, I, I could do a lot of things. I thought I'd throw in just from the last year, some headlines that came from our area uh, in different communities. And what it shows is that we're seeing, you see this incredible demand, this lack of supply, prices are screaming. And we're looking to basically increase supply in a lot of the areas. It's not the only thing we can do to help this problem, but it's one of the main main things that we're looking at. But then yet throughout our community, we see a lot of headlines and a lot of policies that are that run contradictory to it. Now, there's a lot of things that go into development. And obviously, as planners, you have to take in a lot of different issues and things into account beyond just whether people can afford to buy the home. There's transportation, there's infrastructure, stormwater schools, all sorts of stuff. And we understand that. But we wanted, I wanted to kind of lay out the, you know, the, the map here that there's a lot going on as far as affordability in our community that's beyond what people can afford and what people want to do in our community. And we're going to have to start making some hard choices in a lot of our communities as to where we are going to build and how much we are going to build. I can say that you know, slowing or stopping of building is not going to help with those, those issues. So I just wanted to you know, kind of throw that out there. And if we can go to the next slide. I want to give you what our focus is locally, and I, I used a picture here. This is a Habitat for uh, Humanity here in uh, Pinellas County. That's about 25 local elected officials that we that uh, our local Habitat put together to come build this, you know, do a build. And uh, our local association here sponsored the lunch for them, and, and we spoke at it. And we basically said to them, you know, this is a community that needs more construction. But what I also want to say in Pinellas County is you're also looking at the largest single-family home builder in Pinellas County on average over the last five years is Habitat for Humanity. Uh, a lot of our communities across the state are being either built out or financially built out as someone, I like that new term someone told me, is that it just doesn't, it's just not feasible when it comes for affordable housing for single family uh, builders building out in a lot of our communities. Um, is that we start looking at how we build up, but also how we do the infill and how we find ways to make it easier for more development within the communities that are already existing. And that's what we're, we're going to, our focus is, is going to be in the future. Whether it's the upzoning on transportation corridors, pre-approved ADU plans. We're big supporters of expanding the options for ADUs. Jamie is going to speak to that later. We, St. Petersburg was kind of a, an early player on that. But we've also seen is that the average person, is, you know, take someone like me who has no idea how to, how to build anything, develop anything. I have a basic understanding of how local governments work and the permitting process. I could probably find a general contractor, but you've also just mentioned a whole bunch of things that get in the way of taking my son, my one son to baseball practice, the other one to hockey practice, my wife working nights, 
and all of a sudden you become a it becomes a process that becomes owners for the majority of people that own already are owning and occupying the single family lots in these cities that could be having an accessory dwelling unit put on so we're looking at ideas that cities can make that process easier and more streamlined and you know kind of give the the carrot of oh you could make this additional rental income on your property but at the same time it's like how do i do all this you know i've got a lot going on in my life i you know adding a pool to my backyard sounds like a big deal right now versus uh doing you know something like that although i am aware that pools are exploding across neighborhoods across the country especially mine um we're also going to be looking at something that's going to be outside of the planner's view but we're looking at employer assisted housing and we're just kind of pushing that everywhere that we talk to folks you know as we go back to one of the, I don't really need to go back to the other slide, but as I said about, you know, the median household income and 38%, there's a lot of people that make 100 to 120% of AMI in communities that can afford to own a home, but they can't afford to buy a home. They're not able to generate that down payment assistance to the levels we need. I would say Jamie is the number one person, a biggest advocate of this at the state level and working with the Sadowski Trust Funds. Well, we've, uh, in our areas and around the state, we are taking this to the local local governments to say, you need to start putting in your own funds as well. And to start first with your own employees and helping them. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I, I will say this, that there's an employee of the Pinellas County government that said one time is that offhand and privately said in five years, only about 10% of our employees will be able to afford to buy a home in Pinellas County. And I said, and that just was eye opening. Local governments are some of the largest employers in an area. We need those services. So we're pushing, we're going to our local governments first to offer that for their, for their employees. And the final thing is designing for the future. You know, most, most of Florida has sea level rise issues that are going to greatly increase the cost of construction and home ownership. And we're looking at different ways in the communities to encourage designing for the future, but also designing for the future that cars are changing you know the majority of cars 15 to 20 years from now will be electric but the vast majority of homes don't have the ability or aren't currently retrofitted to be able to, to charge a car in a reasonable amount of time and for some houses it's a two to three hundred dollar fix to do that but other houses it can cost two to three four thousand dollars and then if you have older and aging homes it could be an entire electric rewiring of that property we're looking at different programs that would also help with that financially through the local governments, but also looking at writing into the local building, well, beyond what the state building codes has, is adding things like for new construction or for substantial upgrades to homes, which you require that the house have that extra electrical, you know, charge say, location somewhere, either in the carport, garage, however it works. It's also, it's nice when we build these very nice, uh, you know, rental communities, these large, you know, 100, 200, 300 unit uh, locations. But when they have four charging stations and long term, you're going to need more than half to two thirds of them to have charging stations in the parking spots. That's something we need to take into account. It's going to add to the cost of development in the, in the short term, but we believe it's something in the long term. Just like we are advocating for higher uh, elevations for new construction. That adds to the cost in the short term, but we don't see flood insurance ever getting any cheaper than it is today. And in fact, we see incredible increases coming down the road, especially when it goes into effect for existing homeowners in April. These are things that we believe that we can lower the long-term cost of home ownership, the month-to-month -month, you know, mortgage payments for people with some expenses on the front end. It's a negotiation. We want cheaper homes for affordability, but at the same time, we need long, you know, affordability to last longer. So those are the, some of the things we're working on. And that's pretty much where I'll leave it with everyone. I think my next slide is the obligatory, that's my contact info. Um, but if you have any other questions, but our, our goal is when we when our members are out there, like I said, there's 225,000 realtors across the state of Florida. There's 55,000 of them in Miami alone, if you're down there. When, we, when our members are out there and they're working and they're talking to folks is that we, the amount, the number of buyers that come to our community that can afford to own a home but struggle in the upfront, that's just something we're gonna we're gonna be working on. But the second thing also is how we can make long term our communities prepared for not just 2030 and 2040, but beyond that, as sea level rise, as affordability changes, we are those are the where, where our focus is and you know helping out folks that are that want to stay in our community because as Chris told you, they're still coming. They've been coming since the 1950s and they're not gonna stop. So um, with that, I'll, I'll wait till later for questions. Thank you. Thanks.
Thank you, Joe. Actually, there was a question um, that, it, well, with a comment, really, and it's about something that we talked about, which is accessory dwelling units. And, and the comment is that, you know, if we want this, we need to fix our codes to allow it. And I, I just wanted to note that for everyone because you, you just uh, spoke to that. Um, and also, Chris, before I go start on my presentation, um, you had talked about oh, showing us those. It was really mind boggling to look at all, all that you showed us. One of, um, one of the data points you showed us was that it was about a quarter there was an equal number, a quarter and a quarter, of people who would want walkability, but a quarter of them wanted it in a detached, and a quarter of them wanted it in an attached. So a question is, what, why would somebody want choose the attached rather than detached if they were getting the walkability? Oh, I'm sorry, you're on mute. Got it. Thanks. <laughs> um, actually, I, I get more questions on why would somebody in a detached home want to be in a walkable community? Because the impression is they want to be isolated. Uh, but there's a lot of people who want to, you know, have a small lot, a 5,000, 4,000, 3,000 square foot lot. Um, so they're detached from neighbors, but they still want the sense of community around them and walk to the stores and restaurants, nearby park and so on and so forth. But there's an awful lot of people, um, actually increasingly my wife and, and me, um, looking at uh, attached options. Um, no yard to take care of, a much more manageable home internally and externally. Um, attached homes in, in a lot of locations are walkable. Many aren't, by the way, and that's a big uh, mismatch right there. If you want to live in a, in a walkable community, sometimes you can't find an attached home in a walkable community. Uh, so that's and that's where the missing middle housing uh, demand comes right. up. That I've already I've done some research on. So there's a there's a lot of pent up demand for walkable communities in attached homes uh, all across the country, and I suspect also in Florida, especially in the larger metropolitan areas. Very good. All right, I'll go ahead and uh, do my presentation, and then we'll come back to questions. Uh, so I'm I'm guess I didn't really introduce myself. I'm the, uh, the CEO of the Florida Housing Coalition. And those of you who may not know, we are the state nonprofit, statewide nonprofit that provides training and technical assistance on behalf of the state. So uh, free to planners, uh, to local governments. Um, we have a lot of free resources and we're available to you. So I am uh, going to cover some solutions based on what we've talked about, starting with that quick refresher that where does this all start? You got a housing element requirement that's pretty strict and uh, requires uh, local government to provide for their entire and current anticipated, their current and anticipated population for their housing. <clears throat> um, but that doesn't mean you build it. It does mean that you create an environment in which affordable housing is going to be built. And so how do you do that? We've been talking about some planning tools, also financial subsidy. And we heard uh, Joe say that, you know, we, we even need to look, look at local governments for financial subsidy, not just the state and federal, using incentives <clears throat> and also requirements. And this is where I'm talking about land use planning requirements <clears throat> as to create the environment for the private sector, excuse me to produce the affordable housing. <clears throat> okay. All right, Patty. So I'm going to spotlight some of those top solutions. There are lots and lots of them. Uh, first one I want to talk about is removing the land costs and then the financial subsidies, that land use authority to create inclusive communities, preserving the housing that you have. Uh, also, Dr. Nelson mentioned the Schinberg Center data that he was using <clears throat> for what's going on right now in the demographics, the Schinberg Center also has a tremendous resource on the units we're going to lose in, a, in, in, in our housing stock in Florida if we don't preserve them. They're affordable now, but the restrictions are going to come off if we don't preserve them. That is a huge issue. And then, of course, avoiding and overcoming the not-in-my-backyard problem, which I think 
planners are well aware of. So then I'm going to go on to talk about first surplus lands and on to the next slide, which is just pointing out a very important law. And you see uh, references 125. That's, of course, the county statute. There is the exact same statute in 166 for municipalities. Local governments since 2006 have got to take, make all their surplus land, the lands they don't need for government purposes, available for affordable housing. I'm sorry to report that not all local governments yet are doing this. They're not doing it right. They're taking properties that are surplus and selling them and not using the proceeds for affordable housing. This needs some local level um, fix. And as you as planners uh, out there, uh, this falls in your lap. Um, that this really needs to be done right. This was an important statutory change in recognition of the affordable housing need, which we've just heard from our last two speakers, is nothing but increased in crisis. Um, we've got to make surplus lands affordable, available for affordable housing. And the next slide kind of goes through um, what that process is. Um, so you can you put it on an inventory list. You can donate it to a nonprofit. You can sell it and use the proceeds for affordable housing, but not for other purposes. Um, you can do it many different ways, uh, but the point is, look at your inventory of land that you don't need, and I don't mean like slivers of land or right away that are left over or land that's next to toxic use, um, but land that any housing could be built on that would be appropriate because what is appropriate for affordable housing if it's appropriate for market rate housing it's appropriate for affordable housing so it's just a, a place that's habitable so going on to the next slide you'll see we have an entire guidebook on this and it's all free so um, i encourage you to look at our publication on the surplus lands law and the next slide we get into community land trust. There is a dovetailing between surplus lands and community land trust because a community land trust, which is a 501c3, and their mission is to keep land affordable in perpetuity, which means they can't mortgage the land, the dirt. So if you've got surplus land that's good for housing, donating it to a community land trust is the perfect thing to do because they need land. So they get that land and you have a permanent stock of affordable housing, even if the structure that's on it now, years from now is demolished, whatever gets built on that property after that is gonna to need to be affordable. So community land trust is separating the ownership of the land from the building. and so that creates a lot of benefits. You'll see in the last bullet there, the first one is it makes everything more affordable because the buyer's not, if you're using it for home ownership, the buyer's not paying for the land. So that cost comes out of the equation. And if you go on to the next slide on community land trust, I want to explain from the get-go um, that the community land trust um, if you look at the third bullet there, is not an alternative to fee simple home ownership. So we've been talking about home ownership in the past two uh, presentations um, as part of the equation, rental home ownership. CLP is an alternative to renting. I have to reiterate that. It is an alternative to renting. So we're, we have a incredible undersupply of rental units in the state of Florida. We can move people who are now renting into home ownership, community land trust home ownership. They'll be paying less in a mortgage than they would in rent, and they're going to have stability. They're going to be able to build wealth. They're going to be able to not, not, not be subject to eviction and losing their lease every year. So it is way better than renting, and it is a stepping stone 
onto what we think of as be simple, home, the typical home ownership. Next slide. So it increases the supply of affordable housing and it reduces the need for subsidy over time. Um, so for instance, you put shit money into a community land to give to a community land trust home buyer to give them the down payment and closing cost assistance that stays with the property. My organization, the Florida Housing Coalition, we drafted a model policy for local governments to use in their SHIP, LHAP, local housing assistance plans. It's been approved by the Florida Housing Finance Corporation. So that, that money can stay with the property. It helps one buyer after the next buyer after the next. So as local governments, you're having to invest less money to get more families into affordable housing. So there's all kinds of wonderful purposes for a community land trust. And on the next slide, you see that for the homeowner, um, they, uh, in addition to um, the house being more affordable, they do get a return of equity upon resale. So when you move out of your rental unit, you hardly get your deposit back, right? Maybe you get your deposit back. But when you move out of a community land trust home, you're going to get a share of the equity in that housing. I'm not gonna go into today all the mechanics of that. My organization does many, many, many trainings on community land trust and has a primer on it and even a certification program. So I won't go into that today, but just to let you know, um, it, it does get homestead exemption and a favorable tax assessment is based on the resale restricted value of the house. Um, and the nonprofit is a steward for the property. So uh, somebody to help the family as they're in their CLT home ownership. And the next slide, it works for rental as well. And Pinellas is a great example there um, where, was, and it also ties in to something that Joe said, which is local governments raising money for affordable housing. So Pinellas has this penny for Pinellas and affordable housing is one of the eligible uses for the Penny for Pinellas, which was a referendum more than once that's been approved by the voters. And so they've got this great, just beautifully set up. In fact, I have to give a shout out. Pinellas is one of the best uh, local governments as far as uh, moving progressive uh, things forward. Um, they started years ago back with the NSP program, the Neighborhood Stabilization Program, when they put money, whether it's their local money um, or even federal dollars, they put their they put that property into a 99-year ground lease, and so um, they are retaining that as permanent affordability, and they're doing that for the rental housing as well, which is really important because rental housing might be affordable for 50 years, it might be affordable for less than that. So. Having rental housing subject to our, or on top of a 99 year ground lease is very important. And the next slide. Um, this is a picture of the book that we recently did on uh, best practices for community land trusts, along with us when we uh, certified our first six CLTs in the state of Florida for best practices. It's uh, through a Freddie Mac program. Uh, and we're very proud of that. And again, anything you want to know about CLTs, just come back to me. So go on with the next slide. And we're talking about financial subsidies. And we're getting into, this is the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee incentives. You as planners out there really need to know about what the AHACs are doing and helping them to do this well. My organization has been doing trainings right now that we're required to do by statute since we have to have elected officials now. Uh, one on each AHAC. My organization does two uh, trainings for each of them. Um, we're starting on our second year of that. And uh, what we're finding is that some of the things that are really required, like expedited permitting and that housing impact statement, has also not been done to the degree it should have been. And that with an elected official on board, we may see that uh, a better connection there. So there you see all of the, there's 11 incentives that are required for you to look at, but there's so many more. You guys, these were created in 1991 when we put together the Sadowski Act, the summer of 1991. There's plenty more that could be added to it now. Okay, so the next slide. 
is um, an incentive example of an impact fee waiver, right? You need impact fees, don't you? So you can't just be waiving them all the time. So I know uh, folks on, you know, I, I come from smart growth background. So uh, I think most people who know me know I was 24 years uh, with 1000 Friends of Florida. So I'm not such a big fan of saying, oh, oh, we just don't need those fees because they're needed. The reason what they were created is because they're needed. Um, so yeah, uh, it is really important to um, look at your impact fees, look at how you're collecting them. Are you doing it on the size of the unit and, the, and a house that is 5,000 square feet is paying the same impact fee as a house that is 1,000 square feet? Are you waiving it for nonprofits who are passing it on to the consumer, that's a good thing, or are you giving too much away? So it's important to look at those things. Okay, the next slide is uh, density. Should density be um, by right? So lots of times local governments want to be progressive and they're like, we need to increase density because we need more affordability. And so they're thinking, you know, well, in terms of they want more affordability, but density does not equal affordability. And we see this mistake being made all over the place. We're going to just allow more density and then we'll have affordability. It doesn't work that way. So you can look at the most dense cities like New York City, um, really dense. The density doesn't, doesn't, does not uh, equate to affordability unless you require affordability in exchange for that density. Now, the truth is New York is more affordable than the Tampa Bay area, but that's not because of density. That's because they've got transportation and the Tampa Bay area, your families, like Joe, I bet you and your wife each have your own cars and you're going in different directions because you have to for your jobs and whatnot. Whereas if you live in a place that has good transit, then you can afford to pay more for your housing. So our transit costs, you know, certainly affect that. Senate Bill 7103 is something that I think planners around the state, I know elected officials around the state have really misinterpreted um, to mean that they can no longer have inclusionary zoning. That is false. 7103, which says that you have to fully offset the cost of the requirement that you include affordable housing really didn't change anything because we've always had the Burt Harris Property Rights Act, which you can't in, you know, unreasonably, unfairly and, uh, burden the use of property. We at the Florida Housing Coalition have always said, if you're gonna do inclusionary zoning, you need to keep the developer economically whole. I can pull up papers I wrote over 20 years ago that say that. So 7103 uses the language to fully offset the cost. There's no difference. You as local governments or planners for local governments, you're in the driver's seat. When you're increasing the value of private property by changing the land use, you need to require that there's affordability in exchange for that. And in that way, you meet 7103 because you have offset the cost by increasing the value in the property with the land use changes that you've made. Um, so that's what I want to say on that for now. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. And, um, uh, and that is that you shouldn't assume that the savings will be passed uh, to the household because, and this kind of gets back to something uh, our other presenters uh, touched on as well, the market. Housing is priced at whatever the market will bear. People don't sell their house. I go to sell my house. I don't sell my house for what I don't go back and say, okay, I paid ninety thousand dollars for my house, and let's see, and then I put in a kitchen, and I redid this, and then then I added up, okay, that's what I'm going to sell it for, because this is everything I put into it, and I want a little return. So I'm going to add a little return. No, no, we go to the realtor, and we say, how much can you get me for my house? Whatever the market will bear. If there's a buyer who's willing to give me $500,000 for my little house, then I'm gonna take that, right? And if the buyer comes from Saudi Arabia, they might very well be willing to give me $500,000 for my house, right? We not only have domestic pressure in Florida, we've got international pressure of investors. 
also that Joe touched on. So we need to make sure that even we're trying to do the right thing, like for instance, with form-based codes, planners trying to do the right thing, making it easier to develop. If you don't require that affordability be part of the community when you adopt a form-based code, you have now made 7103 real because you can't require developers to provide affordable housing. They already, they don't need anything from you. They already have it as a right. So very important to look at the connection between those two. And the next slide. Um, so this, uh, yeah, I pretty much talked about the, so we're going to using your land use authority to create inclusive communities, which I started touching on. It looks like, go to the next slide, Patty. Um, if a developer, um, is looking for public dollars, that is an opportunity for infrastructure to require affordability. The thing that I really want to touch on is the large scale development and the traditional neighborhood design development. These are two, uh, like new urbanism. These are two uh, types of development that are prolific in the state of Florida. Um, so we have developers, especially we've got ag land that's no longer being used for ag land. Uh, we have large parcels that are turned into uh, residential developments, even new towns, right? So every local government, every county, every city, should have an ordinance that applies to large scale developments, master plans, PUDs, and TNDs that uh, are large scale that requires affordability. And the next slide. The regular, uh, so um, I'm gonna skip that because I think I've already talked about it and I know we're running out of time. It is really important that when you require affordability that you make it enforceable. If you're not using a community land trust, the way you do this is with a land use restriction agreement. It's like a deed restriction. It gets recorded in the public records. It runs with the property and it, it really needs to spell out. What did you require? What did the planning department require in this uh, development? How many units were for moderate, low, extremely low, all those are affordabilities that are defined in 420. And by the way, I know the word attainable housing was used on the title to this session. That is really a political term more than a, um, it's not a defined term. Affordable housing is defined in the Florida statutes in 420. Um, and it's important to have specific performance be the, um, the remedy because otherwise folks will just like pay back the loan or whatever and go market rate. So uh, the next slide um, I wanna talk about is 1339, because that's a really important tool for planners to be using. Right now, St. Pete and Jacksonville are the only ones in Florida and we've had it since 2020. I think it's getting momentum. It's in both, of course, 166 as well as in 125 identical this is like a zoning land use override if folks are doing affordable housing they want to do missing middle housing they want to take a shopping center that darkened a commercial building now because of covid we've got so many commercial buildings that are sitting idle they can be turned into housing and you don't need to you can expedite the permitting by not changing the future land use map or the underlying zoning by using the authority that you're given in this new statute. Next slide. So the caveat of course, is you don't wanna allow it anywhere near toxic uses. It's really helpful in combating nimbyism. And I wanna go on because I know I'm running out of time and nimbyism is so important. I think oh, it, it's really good for missing middle housing um, does ADUs, duplexes, triplexes, and also avoiding nimbyism. There, I have a number of slides, I think we're getting to you on nimbyism and fair housing. And Patty, if you'll move, if you'll move, but yeah. Um, so it's really um, a big issue. And I know we only have like five minutes left. I did a number of slides because I knew you'd be getting them as a handout. 
Um, anybody who wants any assistance on NIMBYism, I encourage you to contact me. Um, I actually do the chapter uh, nationally for the National Low Income Housing Coalition um, every year. I've been doing it for probably two decades for the National Income Housing Coalition on uh, avoiding and overcoming NIMBYism. So I have some expertise in this area. Um, the main thing I want you to know as planners, um, so go on with the slides, uh, Patty, is um, that there is in Florida a provision in the Fair Housing Act that other states do not have, which basically makes low-income housing a protected class. That's right. And if you use the Bird Harris Property Rights Act, the dispute resolution section, along with this statute, you can expedite a NIMBY uh, resolution without the delay that's caused by going to court. If you delay affordable housing, you kill affordable housing. So this is really, really important. So I am going to stop myself because I want to make sure that everybody has time and you all ha you'll have all that contact information and the and actually keep going, Patty, and they'll see that last slide that I have with all of the publications that are free and downloadable. Um, and um, but yeah, you can take a look at that. Um, and let's go back. Let me uh, just um, get these questions unhinged here so I can read them. Um, define walk, ooh, okay. Define walkability. What does that mean to different people? Who wants to take that? Since I uh, talked about it in my presentation, yeah, uh, walkability is in the eye of the beholder. Um, and actually, with the National Associates of Realtors survey I mentioned, they talked about small lots and large lots. Again, small lots are in the eye of the beholder. So it's, it's contextual. Uh, walkability in um, uh, uh, suburban fringe Miami could be different than walkability on, on Miami Beach. Um, but walkability really means you have a place to walk to, a destination, whether it's a park or a beach or a restaurant or a store uh, or, or services. So uh, walkability is up to you to define, but it means uh, a destination to walk to. Now, my wife and I actually walk our neighborhood every morning, but we don't walk to a destination. We just walk to walk. Do I define that as walkable? Um, good question to me, um, since I practice this, but I would say it does not meet the definition of walkability because we have no destination to walk to. You know, I'm embarrassed to ask this question, but are we, do we end at 1045 or 11? Because I was thinking 1045 and I should know this. I believe we had 75 minutes, so that's 1045. That's okay. That's what I thought. Okay. So then um, we'll Jamie, get to this can, next week. Jamie, you can go about five minutes longer if you need to, if you could get your question. Oh, okay. okay. That's great. Thank you, Pat. You're um, so the next question, um, beyond the conversion of areas uh, to historic districts, can Joe please expound on how private property rights are causing increased housing costs? Yeah, there's several things, but the, the main thing, you hit the nail on the head with the historic preservation or historic issues, but also we have certain issues as it pertains to private laterals in a lot of communities and how that's how that's dealt with. We're also dealing with certain issues of sewer laterals. Now, those things go, I'm sorry, to uh, septic tanks. Those things go to water quality and other issues, but what was largely left to different communities based off the size of their lots or where they were and jurisdictionally to other places that that's that's been a concern also as it does to property rights is how in condo reform is going on that's that's going to be a big one moving forward what do i have as the right to the information that's necessarily uh provided when i go to buy a property a lot of people that buy a condo don't get a lot of the information that they need and is that a property rights issue is an affordability issue it's going to cost the associations more money to in the short and long term on those things but mostly it's just th those are the things that we're looking at and how that works. You have a lot of folks, especially out in what used to be rural areas that were on 
you know, their own water, their own septic that are now in suburban areas just because of sprawl who are pushing back pretty hard on what's being pushed upon them. And I can, you can look at communities in Spring Hill, which is in Hernando County, that are specifically other, as it pertains to the BMAP, for those that are under, that know that term, you're, you're seeing people that are pushing back and saying, I, I get there's the environment, but I came all the way out here where it, and it's not my fault that you allow growth to get to me. And that's, that's kind of where the pushback is coming. Thank you, Joe. There's a question here. Since there will be a critical need for affordable housing for critical need workers, teachers, healthcare workers, fire police, CMS, is it possible for hospitals, schools, and other employers to build uh, villages for these workers? Um, if, if you'd like, I can take this one. Um, there is, a, you, you need to consider fair housing laws um, when you're creating housing for a specific group. Um, so that's the first analysis that you have to do, the federal fair housing laws and so on. So for instance, if the group that you were building for was really disproportionately um, white, um, and you might have a fair housing issue. If that's not the case, um, then you're likely to be fine, uh, and especially if you make it not absolute, but a preference. So, um, for instance, uh, school boards also, I had been talking about surplus land, right? Well, school boards sometimes have surplus land, land that they don't need to build more school facility on, uh, but they need housing for teachers. They could use that land to build housing that would be for teachers. Or maybe school, maybe not just teachers, but uh, employees of the school board, right, in general, so that it wouldn't uh, just be for teachers. Um, yeah. Anything from either of you on that question? We, sorry, I'll tell you the real quick. We run into that issue here in the beach communities. We have all these hotels, restaurants, whatever. They're looking at like, how do we get our employees there? I mean, because, you know, it's not easy to get to. And uh, so some of our hoteliers are starting to look at how do we cobble together and put that together. I, I kind of giggled when I first, they were first talking about them. Like, you guys have buildings with like beds in them and Closet. It's like, you know, uh, maybe give one of those up and fit it and do those things. I, I was more, I'm very interested, Jamie, in how you said that, the, the regulatory issues of that, because there's a lot of folks I think that are discussing this. I mean, like Disney World does it. Um, it, it anyone can do it. Um, and that's where we get the ideas for the employer assisted houses, housing. We just feel like going to local governments first, it's easier for us as an advocacy organization to convince them to do it than to go to a Fortune 500 company that has no responsibility to us at all. Very good. Um, there's a number of questions about CLT. So I'm just, and one about a map, if you can see where they are. Yes. You go to the Florida Housing Coalition's website, which is FL Housing. Um, and uh, yes, you go on our CLT portion and you'll see a site, you'll see a map where all of them are listed and, and a lot more information. And another question was, are people uh, restricted in their uh, income? Yes. So it's uh, it's for people. Um, it, it couldn't you couldn't be like a millionaire and uh, and live in a community land trust home. You wouldn't you wouldn't qualify. Um, Jamie, you have time for one more question. And um, what I'll do is I'll cobble all the questions and send them to the panel, and I'll let everybody who attended this question this session know once they've answered, and I'll put it on the chapter website. Oh well, that's that's marvelous. Um, okay, then on one more question. Mobile homes and mobile home parks existing in future. How do you think these play into affordable housing stock now and into the future? Either one of you would like to take that one? Well, I'll just mention I, what I teach at the University of Arizona is real estate. And what I'm finding is a, uh, a kind of a growth industry in uh, partnerships buying mobile home parks all around the country. Um, that tend to be mom and pop operations, um, very low capitalized, uh, in disrepair, um, and what an opportunity! And I had never thought about it before. Uh, so there are partnerships buying these up, you know, for good or bad, but they're putting in money to upgrade them, uh, to uh, hire professional management to be more efficient in things. They have economies of scale, so all of the maintenance can be uh, much more efficient. Um, and they're filling up vacant spots, vacant spaces in these mobile home parks. Um, and they're being converted into 
uh, really interesting affordable housing opportunities. Now, having said that, these tend to be in, in uh, urban fringe areas or rural areas or in metropolitan areas that are not growing very fast because mobile home parks in growing metropolitan areas are stressed price-wise. Uh, but if you're a person who uh, is more or less footloose and you're looking to have a, uh, you know, maybe your detached home, but not a large lot to worry about and a nice rural location, may a, a small urban location, uh, this might be a good opportunity for a, a certain niche of the population, which I'd never thought about before. Right. In We're Florida, seeing, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say the investor owned parks, um, you know, have been, especially when we had that hot market uh, before the foreclosure crisis, we did see a tremendous amount of displacement. Community land trust is a great opportunity. If, if your land is under 99 year ground lease, then bringing a home onto it that you own would be safe and secure. Uh, but otherwise you do have to, you know, if it's your life savings in your mobile home, might want to think twice before putting it on an investor owned park if you're not able to ultimately take it out of there. Uh, only caveat there. If you own your land, that's a whole different story, of course. Joe? We're noticing in the urban areas that they're, they're slowly disappearing. But say you take a community like Pinellas, look, there's an incredible number of them that when you drive in that front entrance, there's a Canadian flag flying. It's a second home option for a lot of tourists. <laughs> um, but we, what I will, and also what I'm seeing is that flood insurance. So the National Flood Insurance Program has the community rating system, which many of you are probably aware of. And the changes that have been coming down in the last year or two are going to make a lot of them unfeasible long term. So you're going to see some changes when it comes to the flood zone, flood prone areas. And, uh, you know, personally, I, I you know, I, I always make a joke is that, uh, you know, that's not a mobile home park. That's a tornado magnet or a storm magnet. It just seems how they can tend to go there. But that's, it's not that they go there. It's a, you know, when damage is, you know, maybe not as bad for single family homes and other structures, they, they, they show. When those those things do happen and they have to rebuild to, to newer standards that NFIP is proving, is forcing upon a lot of communities to continue their community rating system standards, then you're going to see a lot of changes at that point. I think that's it, right? I think we have gone over time and uh, I think uh, I, it looks to me like our audience enjoyed it because we haven't lost them. And so I want to thank Joe and Chris and, and Patty and uh, APA Florida, all of you who attended. Um, thank you so very much. We really appreciate the opportunity. Our pleasure. Thank you so much.